เอาอีเอาอีเอาอีเฮ้ยไปเอ้ยไอ้เก็บเอาอย่ามาลุ้น I like to show you that I want money bro สิ Hi hello hello Hi I'm Jody van der Heide and I'm Michelle October and welcome to your podcast This is the bi-weekly podcast where we unpack and tease out many of the issues in South Africa that we don't understand or just don't talk about. <laughs> and this is episode seven. Seven. I can't believe that we actually made it all the way to episode seven. Imagine we're gonna have ten episodes. It's Imagine. Like a major achievement. I can't believe it. <laughs> and also, the other thing is that. It took us like a, maybe three weeks to get to this point because we had to take a break, and I was literally like <sighs> hyperventilating. Were you? No, not really. But okay, I was like, good. I was a little <laughs> bit like, this is not doing well if we break our, you know, frequency. Yeah. But it's just one week. Yeah. You know, it happens. It happens. Life happens. Um. And we just move on, but we're back. We keep it moving. Is the point? Is the point? And we are part two of the July riots. Yeah. Um. Before we do all of that, do mm-hmm. you have any askis sidebars? I don't think so. Look at you, an accurate factual bitch. I love to see it. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. Maybe after this one, there might be a couple of things. <laughs> I spoke too soon. <laughs> yeah, but so far so good. Mm. Okay, so in this segment, which I call "Things That Actually Happened," <laughs> I love this name. Yeah, this is a good, a good segment. Um, I'm j- I'm discovering this literally today. This like piece. Um, Jody, do you know about Abashlali Basa? Mm. Chondolo. Yes, I do. You know. do. Yeah. Of course, you know. Okay, girl, can you tell us what's happening? Do you know? No, I don't know. I I know what it is. I know like that it's a social movement about housing. So amongst other things. So they are, uh, in English it means oh Zulu. It means the people of the shacks. Abashlali people, base, which means of. And Mjondolo is like the word for shack, I'm assuming. And so basically what they're doing is they organize land occupations. They build collectives. And when I say collectives, it's like dope. Like they find a plot of land and then they develop like a whole community around it. So like we're going to build plants and vegetables. And then we're also going to have like a chicken coop. And you can like come to the shop where we sell our vegetables and stuff. And you can like get some eggs and some chickens, and we make sure that like nobody in this community goes to bed hungry. So instead of like living in a shack where you have limited access to some things, building a community, an intentional community around that, in like empowering, I think that's like, I think that's dope. Mm. Um. So they also campaign against evictions and xenophobia, and they are pro public housing. Yeah. I think this is a dope movement. Like I don't know much about it, but just like reading this, I'm like, oh, that's cool. But they've been around for like like decades. Because I remember like when I was in undergrad, we had to like, we did like readings about them and stuff. So really? They've like, been around for quite a while. Oh yeah, it says formation is two thousand and five. Wow. Oh, but they're in Durban. That's probably yeah. why. And also, Durban soil is. <laughs> it's all that rain. Tropical vibes. Have you seen a Durban avocado? It's the size of your face. <laughs> like no cap, it's huge. What? Yeah, the soil it's so is lush there. Mm, really, the promised land. But then, okay, shame. So the, <laughs> but then what's happening? <laughs> but so what's happening in the news is that there's a piece of like a piece of land that was called Ekanana. No, I said that very white. Ek, ekenana. Shame, and um, 
like it's like it was a peaceful place but it's been turned on its head and what's actually happening is people i am just reading the story now so i can't tell you who these people are but there's people who are coming into this community and shooting people um killing people and these are members of the community and also members of Abba Shale um Basen Basem Jondolo. Members of that community are there. And um this is super super violent. But then apparently the attackers are part of like the a like close to an ANC member in the community. Oh no. So somehow these things are connected and like there's corruption involved and like this article in the Daily Maverick is describing this as a civil war over this informal settlement, which is like, to me, is showing like a lot of what you were talking about in the previous episode about policing. Um, I, I won't say that these people are vigilantes not not mm. not not Bashlali, um not Abashlali, I mean the attackers. I wouldn't yeah. call them um vigilantes because I'm not really sure what their objective is. Yeah. Um or who they are. But this is like an example of where policing is dead. And then you have things like this happening. Yeah. Um also yeah, I I really wonder what their objective is. Well, yes the same thing. By killing the I'll read this. Um, Ekenana residents and Abashlale Basem Jondolo contend that key members of the community are targeted so that the place becomes run down and made into a shack farming project to benefit certain individuals close to the ANC. Oh no, that's so ugly. No, guys. It's disgusting. And you can find this article on the Daily Maverick. It's called We Will Die Here. Mm. Fearful, fearful Ekanana residents resolute on eve of funeral for slain Abashlali land activists. That's yeah. just daily maverick. Must your headlines always be like, I see seashells on the seashore, like so <laughs> yeah. long. I saw that article and I saw the headline, but I didn't, I didn't click on it. Because girl, if you don't know what Ekanana is, or Abashlali, then like, what is this headline telling you? Yeah. Nothing. Once again, agenda setting is like where? Yo, I just don't understand headlines. I also don't understand that. I thought you would understand headlines as a non-journalist media person. As a media I don't person, understand it. as a media person, do better. This is like giving me nothing. Yeah, exactly. That's headline. why I didn't click on it. Be like. <laughs> Gunmen shoot down members of thriving community instead of like that's going to be like, oh, that's what happened. Yeah. But this, again, anyway. Um, the second story is very, very weird and sad. Um, did you hear about the shooting in Somerset West Hospital? Yes. That's there by the waterfront. Hey? Michelle, okay. It's oh, New, new Somerset, Somerset Hospital. Hospital. It's the Whoa. one that's right there by that, that yellow one. Right by the waterfront. There's a very, yellow hospital. It's a very weird location. But yeah, it's there by the... Okay. How crazy is that story? Um, From start to finish, twists, turns... Like a total roller coaster. Like at no point did I know what was gonna happen next. It sounds like something that happens in the US of A. No, it sounds like it's from a John Wick movie. Like honestly, okay, so here's the thing. There's a a man. He's called Jean Paul Malchas, which is like what a name. What a name. <laughs> and he used to be it's a, a very pe- unfortunate surname. It's like Jean Paul. Malchas. <laughs> I didn't even think about it like that. 
saying he was probably called JP more often. <laughs> you know, you know he was called JP. Like, this <laughs> yes, is JP. I, like, okay, listen, is the name hyphenated or not, guys? We don't know. Is it definitely not hyphenated? Because I feel like it should be. Anyway, okay, so this man, he used to be a cop. Then he was like dismissed after being found guilty of corruption relating to drugs and other issues. So, okay, so I'm assuming from like what I'm reading here is that he, he gets into an altercation with another police officer. He sustains a shotgun wound, but he was also like fighting with someone else. I think that person got stabbed. So then he's in the hospital. Somehow, he disarms a Seapoint police constable. And I'm assuming takes this guy's gun and opens mm. fire in the hospital. Yeah, that's so how like I understood it. James Bond escaped from hospital vibes is what exactly. I'm getting. It's very, very intense. Wild! Um, <laughs> he abandoned his bail. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> and now... The even wilder story is that a nurse in the hospital disarmed him. That woman is a hero. Guys, no. what is the story? Netflix, are you listening to this? Netflix, hi! This really sounds like a movie. Exactly that. Literally that. Like, what intonation. And it also happened on... Did it happen on... Oh, no, no, no. It didn't happen on International Nurses Day. <laughs> no, it didn't happen then. But this person here says, as International Nurses Day is celebrated on 12 May, um, okay. we don't need to yeah, really it's not... mention that. Because but this... also, Shay, maybe they're trying to acknowledge nurses. I don't know. Maybe it's an SEO thing. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get those search engine optimizations. Um, so this happened on the 7th of May and so this guy, he like opens fire and then she gets him in the bathroom for some reason and then she, um, she goes to him and she makes eye contact and then she walked towards him and hugged him and I quote, I escorted him into the cubicle. He told me to close the door. That also afforded our staff to then attend to the policeman who had been shot. I felt I could calm down a bit. Although I had noted two patients had been shot and were deceased, there were still two patients that were alive and I needed to save. I kept him seated, standing in front of him so that these patients were kept out of harm's way. And then she was like literally chatting with this guy, having a full-on conversation with him. Mm. Um, eventually she disarms him. Uh, this is like crazy during our exchanges I lifted his face and said do you see this uniform I am here to save life and limb wow eventually he agreed for me to sedate him wow this woman needs a fucking medal her name is Diane Seal. Sister Seal. Di- Sister Diane Seal, you are... Hall of Fame. Yeah, seriously. She's going to go there. a statue there. of you. Sondo, uh, Pravin Gordon, <laughs> Diane Seal. <laughs> Put your lighters up. <laughs> Horse. Horse, Sister Diane. Yo. No, that's crazy. That level of calm. Um, yeah. The fact that she was able to build rapport with this man mm. and that he listened to her and that he allowed her to sedate him. Like, that's crazy. Mm. But that's how you're supposed to deal with these people. You're supposed to, like, talk to them. And yeah. just, like, treat them as a human being. And, like, acknowledge them and... Go towards them and hug, and hug them. Mm. <sighs> that's crazy. That's, like, that's quite a story. I couldn't believe that I had read that. That's a thing that happened in this country. It doesn't sound like a typical South African story. No. It's, it's not one of those. No, but also, like, we don't... 
let me not say hey. Yeah. I was about to say, I know what you're going to say. There's a lot of gun violence in this country. What? <laughs> sure. What a lie. Never mind. Okay, but it's not like the, it's not. You were not like, gonna say mass. You were gonna yeah, say mass shooting. Yeah, like we like don't American style mass shooting. I was very surprised when I heard that on the news. Uh, I was driving or something, and they were like, mm, "Gunmen open fire." I was like, "What?" Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Anyway, so my third story, and this is like so funny. <gasps> funny, a funny story. Okay, so this is guy from the DA. <sighs> <laughs> Okay, I love Rebecca Davis. And this op-ed that she wrote is so funny. It's called, Stian Hazen's fact-finding trip to Ukraine <laughs> brings what? back few facts and a lot of negative noise. Why did he go there? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, why did he have to, why did they, why did they allow him to go to Ukraine? Let me first say the story. Okay, so here's what happened. Just... There's a DA, DA leader. Is he the leader of the DA now? Yes, and he's still... And his name is John Steenhazen. You know, my dad can't stand him. Okay, so what happened is, he decided, out of his own volition, like, just, he woke up one morning and was like, I need to go to Ukraine. No, you do not. (laughs) And he said, the purpose of my trip is going to be a fact-finding mission. John... Just Nobody asked you, okay? <laughs> like, what do you have to do with this? Like, I understand from, like, a foreign policy perspective, you wanted to show, like, if I can come back and reveal some shocking things, then it'll make us look good and position us as people who are willing to take a strong stance against Russia. Okay, sure, babes. Okay, fine, yeah. But it's giving... You know when you go for PE class and you get into the, the hall... And you don't know what the lesson's going to be. And then there's always that one teacher's pet who assumes we're going to do gymnastics or something. Then he starts taking out the gymnastic mats and putting it on the ground. Like, no no one asked him. And then the teacher's like, but we're not doing gymnastics today. We're doing running. <laughs> it's like, nobody asked you to put the mats out. Yeah. Look at you. And also, why do, imagine thinking you are going to go find facts. <laughs> Not even the best investigative journalists, high-level people, know what's going on, but you... What are you going to uncover that has yet not been... Exactly. Un- like, John? It's a bit... That's the word. It's so embarrassing. It's embarrassing, and also, like, you really think you, you are that person, but actually... <laughs> you want to go to a country and find facts about a war... <laughs> But it's also like Why do you think you're a spy? But it's also you know, What do you have to do with the war in Ukraine? Like you could have just made a, Like a statement To be Ooh. like say we do not Like you know An anti-war statement But you didn't have to go there And he came back with like literally nothing to say His briefing session was 15 minutes long No No opportunity for um, Questions from the media and he said, oh, he wants, I think, I don't know if this was like before or after the fact-finding mes- mission, but in a social media post from Ukraine, also he was in Ukraine, he said, the impact of the war was already being felt in the rising, quote-unquote, price of chips in SA school <laughs> tuck shops. can see it in the price of petrol and energy. The price like, okay. of chips in the tuck shop. How do you say that I'm a very involved parent without saying <laughs> that I'm a very involved parent? Can't he, his kids probably get words for their lunch oh! at school? <laughs> no. Ah, that was like such a bird, Jodie. I just want to say so Jodie is looking so 
cute today. Huh? So she went for a Botox treatment and her hair is like geslaan. But then also <coughs> added to that, she's tied her hair up in this cute little ponytail and it's just... It's adorbs. Do you know why I don't like this GHD? Tell because me. this is how I looked in high school. <laughs> exactly like this. Are Michelle. you traumed out? Yes. So I have trauma. That's why my hair doesn't curl anymore. Because I have trauma from constantly having curly hair at school and being teased. Yeah. <sighs> they would... Okay, I'm not going to yeah, share. Yeah, let's not talk about this. We can do another episode let's on Let's not hair share politics. hair politic trauma. But anyway, so that was the segment that I call things Did you that you actually happened. in high school? <laughs> I had to wear my hair curly. So here's what, what happened. What do you mean you had to? We didn't have a hair dryer at home eventually when i was in high school i asked my mom to buy me a thing for my to do my hair but i would do my own hair and it was like incredibly difficult even primary school also because my mom didn't do it so like her. so mm. whenever she did it it was like yes it's now i have to like plait my hair or put in a different protective style because i can't just walk out with this bush and it was like, you know how painful it is to comb curly hair? Yes, I do. Especially if you're not applying conditioner. And if you're just using, like, hair food. That's what they used to do. Like, that is so 90s. It's like, yeah. dry it's... brushing curly hair, <sighs> putting hair food in it. I can literally feel that on my head as you're saying It's that. violent. It's it very really violent. violent. It's hateful. It really is. We can we can have an entire story about hair politics. That was such a diversion. <laughs> Yo, I'm sorry, guys. But you guys also relate, I know. Hashtag triggered. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. So that brings the end of our uh, uh, segment called Things That Actually Happened. May or may not change the name of that segment. I think we need to keep it. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's take a break. Okay. We're back. We are back. Let's begin with part two. Part two. Um, I don't know if anyone can hear like some sniffing or whatever, but Riley, <laughs> the, <laughs> I don't know. How do we introduce Riley? Jodie's um, roommate's dog is here and she is doing dog things. Hopefully she's not going to be too much. Shame. She's so cute. Okay, Riles, I'm sure people won't mind you being here. (laughs) Why do dogs like... (laughs) Okay, never mind. (laughs) Never mind. Now you have to finish the question. It's like... Why do they smell the same things? Do they? Yeah. Maybe things smell different every time. Do you think so? Mm. Every day I learn new things. (laughs) Let's begin. So, in the last episode, we covered the July undress, but the events leading up to and the timeline of key events that took place. You know that that story you told me about the um, the vigilantism in that town. It like stands out in my head. Yeah. It's like such a crazy story that I still can't believe happened. Yeah, it really is. Like I think about it. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. Um, and we also covered like the general context of South Africa, like the more than half of South Africans live in poverty, unemployment, all that, all that, and all that. Yeah. So in this episode, I'm going to offer some further insight into the response of the state, the way that the state attempted to respond, <laughs> or how they responded. So, yeah. So the main source of this episode is the report of the expert panel into the ju- into the July unrest. Um, this report it can be accessed online, like it's publicly available, anyone can read it. Oh. Yeah, all the government reports are. Not all but like But it's like super hard to find, I feel. No, you just Google. July report. Oh. July unrest 
2021 Andres report. <laughs> so, a recap on this report and why it, wa- why it happened was Ramaphosa appointed an expert panel to assess the unrest, the way the government responded, what happened, why, what didn't happen. And this is kind of the main source that I'm using. And this expert panel, in the writing up, in the writing up of their report, did a whole lot of different kinds of data collection to make it as thorough as possible. So they reviewed official documents from the government, they interviewed politicians, ministers, they spoke to researchers, people from think tanks, they really like cast a wide net to get like as much of a coherent picture as possible. They spoke to government people and the people living in the affected areas. So they did site visits also and they did research. They reviewed research by like think tanks. Can you say again who was doing the research? What do you mean? Like who who went and spoke to everyone and went to the sites? So the the experts of this who wrote the report. Oh. So it was headed up. I should have had this. It was headed up by a professor at WITS and then other experts in this kind of field. And the government asked them to do this. Yeah. Oh. Also asked them to do it. He himself. Yeah. He appointed. Not I don't think he appointed them, but he said we need an expert panel to okay. investigate this. Okay. Cool. So this report is super long. It's 157 pages. Oh, hell no, girl. And obviously, I'm not going to discuss everything. Mm. Because. Who has the time? So I want to select two kind of central things that are like super important about how the state responded. Mm. Actually, sorry, three things. One is the response of the police. <sighs> Big one. Two is the state security agency, which is basically like, it's the government department responsible for intelligence, national security. MI6. Yeah. We do have them. Every country, you have to have them. Every country has to have them. State security agency, SSA. Yeah, SSA, the police. And then I'm just going to touch on another thing called the National Security Council. But that's a small little, but I'll touch, I'll explain. I didn't know we had a National Security Council. We have a lot of stuff. What is that? I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna... Hectic. Okay. And these are all, these three things are all responsible for like national safety, intelligence, all that quite stuff. Spy (laughs) vibes. Who? In addition to SAPS, the State Security Agency, i.e. SSA, and this National Council. These are just three. There are like other systems in place also. We have a lot of systems in this country. I don't know how anyone keeps track of anything. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we have too, too many systems. And all of these other systems are in place to allow for decision making on security issues. So a flow chart. <laughs> yeah. Like a BuzzFeed quiz. Like, yeah. With a- Arrows. Yeah. <laughs> In the paper, I don't. I, don't, I did a flow chart. You, because flow charts work. I like them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so let's begin with the National Security Council. So this is a council that consists of the president, and the deputy president, and eight ministers, and it's the only the ten of them in this council. So let me name which ministers. Are involved. Do I even want to know? I'm not going to name their names, but I'm going to name like the department of what they are the most. Oh, of. okay, okay, okay. So it's Uncle Cyril, okay, Deputy President, Minister of Defense and Military Veteran. Okay, cool. Minister of State Security makes sense. Minister of Police, he comes up a lot. Our favorite character because he is Fasin. <laughs> Minister of International Relations, Minister of Home Affairs. Oh, Minister. That's of, isn't that no? That's not my lady Pandor anymore. Where is she now? Education. No, 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 no. Didn't she leave? Okay, whatever. No, I'm thinking of someone else. <laughs> I can see her face, but I don't remember her name. Minister of Finance, OBS. Okay. Minister of Justice and Correctional Services. That's the prison people. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, these are the such prison long... people. 
and the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Yeah, don't ask me. That made me, like, my brain's short-circuited. Yes. And the National Security Council is the highest level of level of government structures on, is- on issues of national security. Sorry. So they deal with coordination of security and law enforcement. They receive intelligence reports. If there's, like, threats to the country, mm-hmm. they deal with this. We have to have these things. Wow. Yeah. And today's years old. Mm. So... The expert panel report revealed the following about the National Security Council in relation to the unrest. <clears throat> the report shows that the National Security Council was not meeting regularly despite warnings that 2021 was going to be a volatile year. So I'm sure the advisors and the analysts and the think tanks were like, guys, 2021 is going to be a bit hectic, mm. but they didn't meet. Um, okay, but it could be a thing where it's like, um, we have to keep an eye out for this, but we have other priorities right now. Yes, I'm sure that was probably So, it. I'll give you that, but as long as there's like maybe, I don't know, a WhatsApp group? <laughs> as long as there's like a Slack? <laughs> yeah. Just so everyone's alive. <laughs> Not me assuming that the, the government has a Slack or a WhatsApp group. No, they definitely have WhatsApp groups, dude. Are you serious? Yeah. Do you think that like, matters of national security are being like relayed via WhatsApp? I hope not. But they definitely have WhatsApp groups. So. Do you think that like Cyril and Becky and blah 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 are all in one WhatsApp group? And it's called like Honestly N S C. It wouldn't surprise me. It really wouldn't surprise me. The idea of that is like <sighs> Yeah. What did they talk about? Anyway. So at the time that this report was released, it was unclear if this council had even met to discuss the unrest. Uh, Okay. The The expert panel interviewed a bunch of ministers. And they asked the ministers, what intelligence did you get that was spoken about in your National Security Council? And they didn't answer. Why? I don't know. And they were asked... Riley. It's okay. You'll be fine. And they asked multiple times. But zero. As a result, the expert panel concluded that the National Security Council, this is a quote, does not seem to have received any clear direct intelligence about the impending violence prior to it happening. End quote. How is this possible? They had they had guns. They who had guns? The people who attacked on the N three. They were coordinated, organized, received their weapons from. I don't know. But the but, and you had no idea. But you are the state security council. You're supposed to have your people on the ground. This is your yeah. job. Yeah. So how? Do you think they really are spies then? Do you think we just... if What if, like, we think that we have a national security agency, but actually, like, there's, there's really, like, nothing? Let's get to it. Oh, my God. <laughs> are the spies, like, an old lady living in mm. Constantia? Uh, so, let's get to the state security agency. Okay. The state security agency and intelligence services faced serious criticism Mm. for not anticipating and warning the government and the police about the unrest. Mm. Like, this is literally your job Mm. to find things out before they happen. Mm -hmm. The state security agency is, of course, a government department, and their mandate is to provide the government and... (laughs) Government with intelligence on domestic and foreign threats... Or potential threats to national stability, the constitutional order, and the safety and well-being of our people. So things like terrorism and sabotage. There's and just all that stuff. no way in hell that they did not know about this. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. Mm. Let's let's listen. 
Now, obviously, it comes to no surprise that this department, like every other department, has its fair share of controversies. <laughs> Disappointed, but not surprised. I'm just so, like, I thought that this podcast was going to, like, reveal a lot of things for us, but it's just... Further cementing. Further cementing, like, the... It's confirming yeah. what we suspected, that nothing is happening. <clears throat> Sorry. So, in 2018, there was a high-level report on the state and functioning of the state security agency. So, once again, we had another big report. And this report found that the state security agency had been compromised by factionalism, serious politicization poor management, bad governments, and inefficiency and abuse of resources, resulting in a, quote, complete disregard of the Constitution, end quote. Oh my gosh. And of course, this report, like all reports, had like really good, solid recommendations on how to uh, try to address some of these things. Uh. And of course... Was it implemented? Ignored. Ignored. Blue ticked. Blue ticked. And the recommend like I read like government reports because of work and the the recommendations that are offered are re- it's like good implementable solutions that will that if implemented would work. Mm. And this report is also available online. <laughs> So since this report in 2018, there has, un- there has obviously been very slow progress in implementing these recommendations. So once again, we have a government agency that was not operating the way it should be, way it should have been. So once again, because of this, the problems plaguing the state security agency meant that they were unable to properly anticipate and do their work to be able to mm. anticipate the unrest. Mm. Now, this is a, a long quote from the report, from the Andres report, but it's like a really good, it's just like written perfectly. Open quote. It struck us as inexplicable that the state security agency, and in particular the intelligence services, did not know about the violence, nor about what form it would take. The intelligence services have at their disposal the most intrusive of state powers and from what we learned did not use such powers to the extent that they could and should have in the period leading up to the outbreak of the violence. Honestly, truly, intrusive powers that they just decided not to use. Guys, there was, still a quote, there was ambivalence and hesitancy on the part of the intelligence services about whether they should gather intelligence about persons with a political profile. <gasps> what? Um, this person seems to have a lot of influence. Um, should we investigate? No, 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 no. Not a priority. Just stalk the quote. What Just... do you mean? <laughs> yeah, bro. Also, remember state capture no, while all this is happening. Dysfunctional relationships between the ministers and senior leadership teams in the departments, in some cases, impeded synergy in the flow of, in, of intelligence which affected decision making. <laughs> now, according to the SSA, they were closely monitoring the situation around Zuma's impres- imprisonment. In doing so, they did what they called threat assessments prior, during, and after the unrest, and noted that there was potential for protest and that they gave this info to the relevant people. So that's what they said. So we have the state security agency saying that they did their intelligence, they had information that stuff would happen, and that they gave it to the relevant people. Yeah, when did they give that? Probably during the time of the unrest. So they, that's what they told this, the people that wrote the report. Mm. But then through this report's investigations, is what I said earlier, mm. that long quote. So some way, mm. this is not lining up. Mm. So if they had, in, if the state security people did get intelligence, 
why did it not reach the right people? Or why did it not reach the right people in time? So there's something about, like, communication. Like a broken telephone bar. Yes. And this is exactly what you also said about the the, the murder episode with that. Yeah. Like, they had all of the information and somehow things weren't getting through to the right ears. Exactly. And again, we're talking about policing. Exactly. No. Mm-mm. So that is what they found about the state security agency. Kind of like the same thing we always hear. Mm. Nothing really, it's nothing new. So let's get to the police. <laughs> Our favorite. Yes, yes. Much like the state security agency, the SAPs faced a lot, a lot of criticism for failing to respond to and quell the unrest properly. Like the public seriously dragged the police. Mm. They really, really did drag them. Now, SAPs has a unit called the Public Order Police. POP. Mm-hmm. They call POP. Now, POP is responsible for crowd management during protests or large public gatherings. What do they look like? You know when there's like protests and then there's like these people in riot gear? The people who are shooting the um, rubber mm. bullets? Them. Mm. They're the POP. I don't like them. Yeah, they're a bit scary. Remember when they the when yes. someone got shot in the chest and died? Oh. Andre Statani. Remember that? Yeah. I don't, I won't forget that. When was this? It was when we were in college. Is this for Fees Must Fall? No, no, no. It was before Fees Must Fall. It was some other thing. And they just shot him in the chest and they killed him. Correct. Yeah, so... So you can pop off to another planet. Pop. Yeah, Riley agreed. Oh, I thought he was having. She was having a mental breakdown, but he just yawned. She wants to go outside, but like, there's nothing for her. Sorry, Riles. This is just the way that it is. It's just you imprisoned. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we've got pop. The functions of pop are as following: the policing of public gatherings, combating serious and violent crimes. Okay. Rendering of specialized okay. operational support. I don't know what that means. Um, Special police operations, I think, is what it means. No, I guess it means like when you when you're dealing with crowd control, like making sure that you have like people in the right places and in the right positions to channel the flow of traffic. Or well, I don't know, but yeah. it's like, I guess it means like if there's like. Um, State of the nation address, then maybe they part of that. Yes, definitely. Whatever. And we already spoke about crowds and stampedes. <laughs> Jody's greatest fear. <laughs> so, when there is a crowd management situation or a public order situation that escalates, that has the potential for public violence, that's when POP comes in. Mm. Um, so, in the case of the July unrest, POP was needed to come in to restore order. And POP is allowed to use the following tactics. Mm. The use of firearms and (gasps) sharp ammunition is prohibited. Oh. (laughs) Yes, this journey. (laughs) Scared me. No live ammunition, people. Yes. Now, the police are allowed to use live ammunition, but only in in certain specific situations. Okay. You, they can't just fire whenever and however they feel like But it. I feel like they have, eh? They have in the past, but it's not allowed. Okay. It's something about, like, if... If, if like, a sus... If you are in a situation... If you are a cop and a, su- and a suspect is pointing a gun at you, your life is in danger. Okay. Then you can. Take out your gun. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know... I don't know the details about that. So they... Pop is not allowed to use live ammunition. Pop. <laughs> Pop. They are allowed to use tear gas, water cannons, and other measures may only be used by Pop members on command from the commander. Okay. So only when they get, like, the go-ahead. Yeah, but your commander can also be a piece of shit. Yeah. Rubber bullets. I'm very scared of rubber bullets, bro. 
I'm scared of all of these things. They can kill you. Yes. Because you, you, it's still being loaded into the same gun. Rubber bullets may only be used as an offensive measure to disperse a crowd in extreme circumstances. Everything is extreme to them. But Everything is extreme in this country. I'm just delivering a bunch of hot takes today. <laughs> um, now, the, like I said, the police were seriously criticized for failing to respond to the, to the unrest. Thanks. Now, it is unclear whether they were applying these rules strictly or whether the deployment of pop broke down completely or whether there was complicity in the violence as part of the police uh, that last suggestion is the scariest yeah this is and this is what they say that the report says so let's get into what the police knew and didn't know about that oh my god now the police is also they also obviously use intelligence and their little peoples their eyes and ears on the ground (laughs) okay so the report this is everything i'm reading is what the report found okay so the police knew that there was going to be some protest in response to to zuma's arrest or him handing himself over like that's fairly obvious okay so they knew that so they expected the unrest to be localized and typical of what we usually see in this country okay fair enough okay as a result, <laughs> as a result, roadblocks were roadblocks were set up on the major routes. That's what they did. Good thinking, and deployments were made to key areas that they thought there were going to be protests. Why do you set up roadblocks if there's a protest? I think it's to prevent it from spreading. Hmm. Or to prevent people from driving into a protest mm. and being, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. So it's like for safety, but also to prevent it from escalating. Mm. Okay. Um, sorry, I just lost my place. Okay. So they knew all of this, but what they did not anticipate <coughs> was the speed, scale, and manner in which the protest would manifest. Mm. Which, like I said in the last episode, was unlike anything else that we, we had ever seen. So it caught everyone of God. Now, remember the last episode, like you mentioned, started on the N3 with a torsion of the tracks. The police expect, suspected that it would start on the N3. N3, good for them. So they went to the N3 and they did their things. They thought it would start there. Yeah. Or not it start there, but they suspected, okay, N3, let's just like keep a watch there. That's interesting because there's nowhere it's nowhere near a jail, so why there? What do you mean jail? It's nowhere near where he was going to be locked up. Doesn't matter, yeah. So like it's interesting that they knew that this was going to be a place mm. like why would you want to protest on a highway? I mean, uh, but this well, is the intelligence that they got. Interesting. Okay, so the police suspected that the the b- protesters were going to be on the N3. Mm. So they went to the N3. They started doing their whatever police tactics they do. <laughs> um, but the report found... Uh, you, this is, you're going to be so upset by this. The report found that the same police who were on the N3 had to leave to attend to an incident where a truck was burning in Peter Maritzburg. It was while they were there that the tracks at the Moy River Tall Tall Road were torched. <sighs> Guys. Peter Maritzburg also, like <laughs> why are they not why couldn't the Peter Maritzburg police go there? Because apparently they were all on the M3. I don't understand. So this is this is this is concerning to me. The understanding of the Gauteng, quote, the understanding of the Gauteng political and security leadership is that the agitation for the violence in Gauteng originated from KZN. We know this. Social media posts were circulating asking, Gauteng, where are you? In some cases, people involved in the unrest traveled in taxis from KZN to Gauteng to join the right to the unrest day. No. Yes, I've seen in multiple reports. I've seen this in multiple reports. That's wild. Like, road trip, let's start a fire in another province. 
Yeah. What kind of vacation is that? <laughs> that's more stressful, guys. Yeah. That yeah. Like that's from that's agenda. That's a hectic agenda. Because Absolutely. you're not taking a break, you're not going camping, you're not going to the beach, you're literally going to another province to, to start a protest. To start create to entice violence. Um major red flag. Wild. Major, major red flag. It's also giving organization. Correct. Who's pitching in for petrol? All of you. It was I saw the roof <laughs> for petrol. Where did they get the, the minivans? Where did you sleep when you were on that side? Did you pack sleeping bags? Did you pack a cooler box with food? Because these things, this requires money. It's like, and that's why I was like, what kind of holiday is this? <laughs> So the police admitted that the large number of protests and and looters and people was overwhelming. It was a lot, a lot of people. Now, remember in the previous police episode, I did. I spoke about how we are a population of 60 million people, but there's only a finite number of police. Yes. So it's so difficult to manage the, that amount of people. Uh-huh. The crowds were violent. We know this. Civilians were injured and some police officers were also injured. And I remember during this time, people on social media were like, why are the police just firing the guns? Why aren't they just shooting? Because people... yeah, Cringe. Because, first of all, they cannot just shoot (laughs) willy-nilly. You can't just shoot willy-nilly. Into a crowd of people. And they can only use for their firearms in very certain specific conditions. And public violence is not one of those conditions. Yeah, but also, like, the name of the game is de-escalation. The name of the game is to not commit mass murder. Wh- people who tweet things like that, I urge you to emancipate yourself from your thinking. Please. And the Pick other up a book. Thing, and the other thing, which is... Very, very important about why don't the police just pick up arms is what happened the last time police did this? 34 minors got shot. <laughs> and do you remember the... Oh, right. Not me stupidly asking at the beginning of this episode. But they have used live ammunition before. <laughs> hey. And it was a shit show. Not me repressing the trauma of what happened. That was very traumatic. Trying to forget that our government literally killed a bunch of people. And the police got into serious, serious trouble because of Americana. Of course they did. And the saps, the police know that... We cannot have that again, ever. That's the kind of tweet, like, that kind of, like, posing that kind of question. It's giving racism. I'm sorry. Just is. Oh, what the people, why can't they just shoot? Why can't you just open fire? I just want to say that. Are you insane? There's a, there is a study, and I think I may have mentioned this to you. There's a study that you can read on the internet that shows the demographics of gun ownership in this country. Yes, we've, we've mentioned it. End. End quote. That's all we need to say. That's all we're going to say. Figure it out for yourself. See if you can math the math. You obviously know what it is. Mm. Um, and so the, so the, the police know that they cannot have another Marikana on their hands. Ever. It's even scary to say that word out loud, eh? It's a very scary thing. Mm. So, under no circumstances... And they know this, and South Africans also know that we cannot have that again. Um, so, the public already has very low levels of trust in the police. So, if the police were firing willy-nilly, if they were super brutal with protesters, it would have been big trouble. Mm. There is a study from... There's like this... I don't know if they're an NGO, but organization Afrobarometer that does surveys across oh, Africa. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And the one that was released either this year or last year, I can't remember, they did a study, public survey of South Africans. What government institution do you trust the least? Mm, police. The least. Mm. That's such a tough question. And police 
most South Africans trust the police, think that the police is the police. most corrupt out of mm-hmm. all government institutions, and they have less confidence, they have the least amount of confidence in the police out of everything. Did that include like Prasa, yes. Eskom? Yes. That's very low. It's a very, very low amount of trust. There's another study that also looked at public levels of trust in the police. And it looked at it from 1998 to 2021. And at no point in those X number of years <laughs> what did, South Afri- did even half of South Africans... Sorry, I'm not saying that right. The level of public trust in the police since 1998 and 2021 has never been higher than 50%. <laughs> Between when and when? 1998 and 2021. Sure. That's like from heydays <laughs> to now. It's just never been good. Never. So the only two times the lowest levels of trust that the study found, it dropped to 27% post Marikana and it dropped to 28% post July riots. And I know this because I included it in the paper that I was writing this week. <laughs> Flex. So there is no doubt that the police had insufficient capacity to stop the violence properly or to be able to respond in the way that they would have mm. liked to. They really were outnumbered. Seriously, they were outnumbered. That's scary. That's scary as fuck. Also... To think that the police are outnumbered by us yeah and your only job is to control us and you can't do that and now i'm not saying that the police i'm not defending the police or saying oh shame I'm, uh, but i'm trying but to, like, it's worrying yeah as an institution whose only job is to <laughs> ensure peace and it was problem so they had trouble stopping the violence because there was violence in happening all at the same time but in different areas Mm. and it took a form that was unfamiliar to the police it was like this new kind of unrest that we had never seen before especially like the attack in the infrastructure and the warehouses and the malls that's not that was Mm. never seen before Mm -mm -mm. um more like so besides this the people were that were doing the unrest they were young people they were old people they were mothers with babies. Now must you just shoot in the crowd like that? Yeah. Never. It's not going to work. So the police were in a dilemma about how much force they were supposed to use. Because it's just chaos. I, but, no, but I'm actually... I don't understand this, to be honest with you, because this is not a country that's new to protesting and to even wide-scale protests. Mm. This is not unfamiliar territory at all. I hear what you're saying, but I also don't I don't buy it. That they yeah. are like un unsure what to do and how to act. Okay, so I might yeah, there might be some answers as I go on. Another thing is when the by the time that the police were called upon and the when the by the time that they were deployed a lot of other things had like taken place by the time they got to where they were deployed. Mm. So there was like a time lapse. Mm. It's one of the other things. Budget constraints. No, man. <laughs> Budget constraints could have also resulted in pop not having enough equipment, such as rubber bullets, tear gas, la 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 la. So even though they're like one of the most well-resourced agencies in the country, they're unable to effectively deploy their own resources. Now listen to this. When I read this in the report, I was like, are you nuts? We were informed that there is only one water cannon per province. (laughs) Wait, wait, it gets worse. A water cannon from another province had to be brought in to help KZN. And South Africa is big. It takes a long time for to get something from one province to another province. It doesn't happen in an hour. A water cannon. So there's only one per province. So basically, are you telling me there's nine water cannons in this country? <laughs> uh, uh. 
Oh. I'm not. No, and, I'm, it's, and it's such an effective tool of de escalate of de escalate escalated de escalation because number one, it's non violent. Okay, wait. I stand to reason that. I mean, I what you mean. Yeah. I know, like, the negative impacts of a water cannon, but like, it's not like rubber bullets. It's not like. It's not live ammunition. It's like it's literally water. Yeah. Um how how is this powerful de escalation device not widely available? And if it's not widely available, why do we not have alternative forms like I don't know, the fire truck with a hose pipe? Exactly. Surely exactly. if you were to rain water from a fire truck down on people they would be like, Oh no, I'm going home. This is not nice. It's not nice being soaked through your clothes. It's not like a... It's not a vibe. When given the choice, stay here or go home and dry off. Yeah. I so, mean... And then I should have included this in, in the story, but I also remember seeing that a bunch of... Wait, let me say it when I talk about the military. Okay. So the police were caught of guard. They had only one water cannon for the whole KZN. One water cannon for the whole Gauteng. Budget constraints, outnumbered, la 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 la. So we can understand, we can understand that the police, that just one police officer on the ground was overwhelmed. Mm. So after a few days, the government was like, clearly the police is not coping. So President Ramaphosa was like, okay. It's time for the defense force. So we deployed the army. Now there's this sense that the army is so much better equipped and so much readier for things. Yes. But I also just want to say that the army is not meant to be in its own country. It's not the whole point. You like go there. Yeah. Or you like, you wait. You're, su- it, like- you're supposed to like the army is like now listen this is a very very hot take I might be like so off key here but are, isn't the army for like wars yeah yeah I mean not only wars but wars isn't it like Nas- it's literally that, like it's, it's national when things threaten the South African state when outside things threaten the South African state, that's when you bring in the military. Among other things, but yeah. So, <laughs> so this is the, precisely the point. So, the South African Defence Force were then deployed, and they are not typically involved in local protests. This is not, that's not their job. It's so but, irregular. But, when it's extreme situations, they are, the president can deploy them, like the unrest. I totally understand that. Um, and when they are, when the defense force is deployed, they have the same powers and duties as SAPs. With the exception of they are not allowed to investigate crimes. SAPs is the mm. only, only sub- agency in the whole country that can investigate stuff. Mm. So when the South African defense force is are deployed, they are there to support the police, to make them feel less overwhelmed, overbold, overburdened, no, no, no. A total of 25,000 <laughs> defense forces were deployed to help the police. Now, when you say 25,000 forces... Sorry, I mean 25,000 individuals. Oh, okay. Sorry. And the when people are trained in the military, they are not trained for policing-related activities. Mm. So, this is not really their area of expertise. Mm. So, it's not really fair to expect them to be experts at policing local situations and things. I also think that a big part of what policing is, is being part of the community. Mm. Because... Um, being very familiar with the community that you police enables you to do a better job in terms of knowing what needs to be dealt with exactly. and what the priorities are. And so for the military to come in with absolutely no context, yeah, like not like not being a part of the community, just coming in from the outside, 
Yeah, exactly. And that, but that is why it's only in serious, extreme mm. situations. So, that's what's happening. <laughs> so, the methods that the protesters and looters, like the method of the unrest was unfamiliar, so it took everyone by surprise. They were, police were inadequately equipped, they ran out of resources, i.e. the one water cannon per province. <laughs> they were totally outnumbered. And another interesting point is, remember in my first episode, just the general state of the SAPS institution? Mm. The working conditions of many of the police stations in the areas where the violence took place were not conducive to police providing a productive and professional service. Because of all the mm. issues. Now, remember in the, also the first policing episode I did, I spoke about the police minister and the national commissioner and how they do not. Yes. How they... Never forget. Cannot even be in the same room, despite yeah. the fact that they have to always be in the same mm. room. They don't like each other. So, this poor relationship between the police commissioner and the minister of police did also not allow for great communication. I can imagine. While 350 people are died. Mm. This is the last thing that I want to say. (laughs) The report, the people in this report, they interviewed the police minister and they interviewed the police commissioner and said, what the hell happened? Mm. Explain. Mm. The report states the following, within SAPS, there appears to be no channel to submit intelligent reports to the minister. This is not basic stuff. No channel to submit intelligence reports to the minister of police. The minister, they interviewed the minister of police. He doesn't have an email address, no secretary, nothing. (laughs) The minister of police said the following, that he did not receive any intelligence report from the National Commissioner from at least December 2020. Never mind even the protest then. It's so cringe. It's so awkward. And it's also like, on its face, like the statement that there's no channel of communication is so wildly wild to even suggest. Yeah. That someone with an office who is a human being with people around them is unable to be contacted. And exactly, so it's the National Commissioner is the top cop, he's the head of SAPS, and right above him is the Minister of Police. There's no other people between them. There's yeah. no other like levels. It's just them. Why can you not pick up the phone and phone him and tell him, this is the information that I have? Mm-mm. You guys don't like each other, but it's a national crisis. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. So that's what the Minister of Police said. However, the National Commissioner told another story. Okay. He said, yes, we had intelligence. We did threat assessments in the days leading up to the unrest. Be that as it may, the Minister of Police, this is a quote, The Minister of Police said this. The National Commissioner is expected to provide him with the initial threat and risk assessment to early warning report before the unrest. And they need to keep communicating through feedback, updates, briefings, with the aim of providing insights and understanding so that the Minister can make a contribution to broad strategies and make decisions. This didn't happen. Who said that? Sorry, this is the report said this. Yes, yes. So, on the one hand, we have Minister of Police saying, I didn't get any info from the top cop. Mm. On the other hand, we have the top cop saying, I did have information. Yeah. But somehow, he didn't tell him. So, it's like, I I needed the information. Yeah, no, I had the information. Uh, okay. But then, like, the police commissioner is then at fault, quite clearly, for him to suggest that there's no channel of communication with his superior officer. Like, that doesn't make sense. So, somewhere along the line... I feel like it's quite obvious what happened. And this really points to 
no communication, not even a sense of, it's not even a sense of, oh my word. There was no sense of urgency. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And top cop needs to tell the minister so that the minister can go tell Ramaphosa. But it also seems to me as though, the like the lack of urgency for me just means that literally no one cares. So there's a clear, just, like, it's just giving me apathy vibes. No, no sense it just of feels urgency. Like they're just waltzing around the office, like. No concern that there's a major national crisis mm-hmm. going on. Cyril's running around trying to do something. The intelligence people are like, oh, we got information, but the law law. Now. What is good? Like, how? And this it's is like the end Hitchcock. of this. Hitchcock. It's like a whole department just run by Hitchcock and Scully from and Brooklyn this, Nine-Nine. And this is like the last thing that I wanted to say. And that is the end of the story. And I really wanted to end it there because it's just like, how the flip? Okay. That's the end. And that's the <laughs> government's response. That's the way the police responded. That's the way that the intelligent people... It, Intelligent people, the intelligence services and state agency responded. It really feels like it. It it's like broken telephone. That's exactly yeah, what it is. That's the only way. It's messages that are firing off and then fizzling out. It's. It's like people receiving things and being like, "Okay, just put that on the desk with everything else that needs to get done," and then literally never get into it. Meanwhile, if it was a snake, it would have bitten you by now. It's insane. Like, how... I don't understand how people don't understand how important their jobs are. Yeah, and this is part of the reason why the South African state functions the way that it does. It's bad governance, and it's bad... It's like basic principles are not being adhered to. I would love for the commissioner and the, like, for them... Go and meet the families of the people who died while you were, like, waffling around... (laughs) Yeah. Scratching in your bum when you should have been paying attention. Like, go and meet with them. Have have them shout at you and cry in your face because you clearly don't understand the magnitude of what your job is. Yeah. Yeah. That is what it is. You have, like, you have no concept. I really think that they are detached from reality. They live in their own little... No, with their salaries, that's... A, I, I mean, yeah. I, I've said this a million times before. Give them the salary that is fit for a public servant. If you're serving the public, only, you should only be able to access the public services that the government offers you. There's no reason why you need to have such a high salary. Because they're not even doing anything. N- not just that, but like... You need to make sure that you put in place systems that are efficient enough for you to want to use them. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if it's like government bureaucracy and government, you have to go through specific channels and having to do certain procedures. I don't know if that's what the problem is. But surely, like, in cases of national crisis... You should pick up the phone and call the minister. Yo, dude, this is the information. It can be both at the same time. It can be that you have certain procedures that you need to go through. And it's not necessarily the fact that the procedures are too laborious or anything like that. It might just be that the people who are the links in that chain are also like floating around Mm. and not working efficiently. It could be every chain. I mean, every link in the chain that's that's not firing on all pistons. It could yeah. be that. And it can also be the fact that you guys don't like each other. You can't pick up the phone and talk to each other. And you can't be professional in the workplace. Yeah. Because that's what it boils down to. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, yeah, I think it's both of those things. Super upsetting. And lives are lost. Like, money is lost. 50 billion gone. And, and because of, like, what for what? Yeah, for what? Yeah. Thank you exactly. for doing this research. 
in the next episode i'm gonna be talking about something that's dear to my heart it's still not like the most important episode that i'm dying to do i still have not which one is that i'm dying i think i know but i don't want to say what do you think it is Corruption is not a new problem in South Africa. No, no, no. (laughs) That's also going to be a beautiful topic. But the one that really irks me the most is like the thing that I'm most passionate about is public transport. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So that's going to be an episode that I want to do. It might have to be cut up into pieces though, like taxi, bus, train. Do you know what I learned? Golden Arrow is not a a government... I, I know! I know. They're doing it just because. It's a privately owned company. Yeah. Which ex- does not explain why they are so bad at their jobs. The bus services. It's private. I was also shook when I found that out. Because I was like, this is Golden Arrow is so bad because it's pub- publicly owned currently. There's some rich to profit in. So I would love to do the story of identifying why public transport is so incredibly inefficient. But alas, I'm going to be talking about mobile data. That oh, bro, you know what? You know what's on the list for all the no, podcasts. No, I did, but I didn't know the order you were doing it in. <laughs> Lol. Anyway, so we're gonna talk about mobile data. I recently this comes from a personal place actually because <laughs> recently <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. Shame. I had to wait like eleven days for my Wi-Fi to be set up in my new apartment. And that entire time I had to rely on mobile data. And when I tell you Michelle, how much money I spent... Michelle was having mental breakdowns because I would get messages. <laughs> mental breakdown after mental breakdown. Bombshell after bombshell. <laughs> it was just a hot mess. I don't even want to ask you how much you spent. I, don't even, I actually don't want to know the answer. I might reveal it in the next episode. Because okay. it was just... I would be on my phone, hey, open one app, and then I get an SMS from Talcom being like, you have 400 megabytes remaining. I'm like, I just bought a whole gig. Like, I don't understand. Yeah, it's very, very, very distressing. The lack of access to information in this country is violent. (laughs) I will die on this hill. Anyway, that's the end of this episode. Rochelle is worked up. Yes. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? I, I don't know if there's time to even say this. No, there's definitely no time. Fuck it. <laughs> I think this episode is like at least two hours long. I'm sorry, guys. Thank you, guys. We hope that you're not as upset as us. Um, we encourage you to take some deep breaths. I was going to say something else, but I don't think I should say it on a publicly available thing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks guys. Like, follow, and if we made mistakes, please email let us. us. Know. Uh, send us an email at your podcast at 21. Oh shit, your podcast 21 at gmail.com. You can follow us on the twits. Your underscore podcast. Um, why don't you, like, tweet us, like, the part that you thought was the most informative ha- or the most, like, funny or whatever. Like, at us. And then we'll, like, I don't know, <coughs> retweet. Give you a shout out. We'll be like, yay, look at this person. And then also share. Share, share with your um, family members that have no critical thinking. Share with your co-workers that you like, who's constantly talking about how the government is going <laughs> to the dogs. <laughs> Be like, here are some, some things for you to consider before yeah. you just start ranting. Yeah. Um, you know, it's Linda from HR that says that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to make those part noises with my mouth. <laughs> okay, people, the people are sick of us. Okay, bye! bye.